amen and amen, right? Woo. Last week, I shared a story that was a little bit difficult for me to share, and the, the, the bulk of it was that there was a season in my life as a child that uh, these kids were after me, uh, had been bullying me, part of a gang, and uh, they rode my bus home with me. I got off the bus and ran to my front porch where uh, an authority figure was there waiting for me. And I was crying and in tears and looking to them for some protection. And they looked at me in my fear and terror and called me uh, a sissy and told me to quit being a sissy and go take care of business. And I used that story just to talk a little bit about how the arrows of our lives become broken. So what I thought I'd do this weekend is share a contrasting story because in my life, God has been faithful and he has broken generational curses. And, and so what happened to me in my life because of that moment, I became fearful or hesitant to run towards anybody from that moment on. And sometimes even though while I was serving God, not realizing that oftentimes I wouldn't even run to God our Father. But God's done a work in me, and if he did it in me, he can also do it in you. I want to show a little video. I'm going to take a pastor privilege. More than that, I'm going to take a pop-pop privilege right here, all right, everybody? Because this is my little three-year-old granddaughter at her first day of school coming out of the classroom after she's been there to contrast the story of last week. Can we look at it real quick? <laughs> yes, I'm a pop pop. All right, everyone. And don't you love that the backpack is bigger than her? Huh? <laughs> you, we just can't overlook that part. But listen, everybody, that's exactly what God wants us to do. I know we're in grown up bodies, but some of us have childish emotions. That, and what we need the most is what we do the least. And that is run to the father. He's not ashamed of you. He's not mad at you. He's not disappointed in you. He loves you today. And he brought you here today to remind you that he's madly in love with you. Come on, everybody, right? Wow. See, what happens is God designed us to be arrows, arrows that that, that soar through the sky, arrows that sail straight, arrows that hit their targets. And, and the targets are his plans and his purposes for our life. But how many know along life, life happens and sometimes it, it fractures. Sometimes it's in big ways, sometimes it's in small ways, but life happens and begins to fracture the arrows. And it's in the area that we're fractured that is often the area that we continue to miss the mark because it's in the areas that we become broken that have some, um, some identification as to why we continue to struggle in the same areas. But I believe that God has brought you here for this series because God wants to restore because that's what he does. And he wants to restore broken arrows because it's not too late. You still have a target to hit. You still have a destiny to fulfill. Amen. Now, while I'm talking about that, let me just take five minutes. It's going to look like I'm rabbit trailing. But many times those accidents, they happen in our life when we're children. And, and many times what happened 20, 30, 40 years ago in our childhood is still showing up in our adulthood. Come on. Sometimes it's those things that happen way back there that, that prevent us from hitting the target in adulthood. And, and so I'm going to talk about that in just a minute, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk to the parents in the room for just a moment. See, the parents in the room for all age group, but, but particularly the young kids. Man, God has pl placed those arrows in your quiver. They placed those arrows in your home. And moms and dads, we got a lot of young families here. We have a major responsibility. See, you can do a lot to provide a quiver where the arrow is protected. And we have a responsibility to aim those arrows in the direction that God would have them go. So let me talk to you for just a moment. Parents, let me kind of break this down just a little bit. How many are in here? You have kids that are zero to four years old. Can I just see your hands? Holy man, you guys need prayer. Father, help them. 
It's a miracle you're here, all right? Uh, and, and so let me show you this. From birth to preschool or from zero to four, let me give you a couple things to think about. First of all, parents, don't take your eyes off the ball. If you think kids are an interruption, then why did you have them? They will be an interruption until you die. <laughs> when they turn 18, doesn't mean they stop interrupting you. And what I want to say, listen to me, listen, I, I want to say this in kindness and in firmness, all in the same thing. In the world where there are so many distractions, there are cell phones, there's internet, there's social media, I would beg you parents to turn off the cell phones and put your eyes on your children and do not take your eye off the ball because they're going to come running to you when they're in trouble. Come on now, right? Yeah, and it's, from, and it's in this age that their character formation is happening. The way they perceive the world, the way they perceive you. It's zero to four that their character development, who they trust, who they don't trust, what they love, what they dislike, all those things are being formed in their little brains at that point. And I would just say this to you, and I'll move on to the next one. Be very, very concerned. I tell the young men on Tuesday nights this. Be very concerned with pool. Pools, pals, and predators. Pools, one second turn in your face from them, and they can be in the middle of the road. How many know they'll find that road? And pals, uh, uh, you, you need to know who they're hanging out with. And you need to know that there's a devil out there, and there are predators out there trying to break the arrows and destroy little Johnny. How many know what I'm saying? And then they move to the next category, and that's elementary to middle school. It's the 4 years old to 10 years old. And, and here's what i just say really quick. Put them first in your life. Let them feel that they are of the utmost importance in your life. And I would say it's when they get to this age to don't solve every problem, but make sure they know where to go when they can't solve it on their own. Make sure that they know that daddy's in my corner. Make sure they know mama's in the corner. Make sure that you teach them to fight a little bit, but when the battle is bigger than them, they got somebody to retreat into. Hello, everybody? Yeah. Then they move to that crazy age, 11 to 18. <laughs> Middle school to high school. Mark Twain says you put them in a barrel at 11, but when they turn teenagers, you, you've been feeding them through the hole in the barrel. Now plug up the hole. You know, all right? <laughs> But when they're in this age, quit calling every age terrible. Well, they're the terrible twos, and now they're the terrible junior hires, and now they're the rebellious teenagers. Quit labeling them these things. God has placed these arrows in your life to help aim them in the direction that they should go. In this age group, just build their confidence. Keep telling them that where they're at is not where they have to stay. Come on. Tell them they'll grow into those feet. You know what I'm talking about, right? Right? Give them identity. You see, every kid is looking for identity. And when we miss our identity, most of the time because we don't have fathers in our home, we get our identity through our fathers. And that's why we wear our father's last name. And our dads are supposed to help us find our identity. And our identity is the doorway into our destiny. And if fathers are absent, we miss our identities and we miss our destinies because the arrows become broken and can't hit the target. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I don't want to say that too negative because there's always exceptions to the rule. When we make God our Father, right, everybody? And, 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 and speak positive words over them. Speak about their uniqueness. They're looking for somebody to identify what makes them unique. And if the parents aren't that voice, then they will look somewhere else. Come on now. That little girl will look to some knuckle dragger for her uniqueness. How many know what I'm talking about, right? And so help them find their uniqueness. Be involved in their life, but also let them breathe. Let them have opinions. Even when their opinions start looking different than yours, it's a sign that they're growing up. Come on, everybody. Give them roots, but also give them wings. You see, friends, we live in a fallen world. But parents, we are assigned to protect those arrows and aim them. And for the adults in the room without kids, many of us are sitting here going, yeah, but what about me? I'm 50 years old now, but I'm still broken from what something happened back then. 
Our theme verse is found in Psalms chapter number 127. And here's what it says to us. Psalms chapter 127 tells us this. Oh, uh, I'm used to having it. <laughs> Let me just read it to you. I've had it up here most weeks. But children are a heritage from the Lord. They're, they're offspring, a reward from God. Watch this. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children to one's youth. See, we're like arrows. And it's often, again, the brokenness of childhood. It's the brokenness that comes through abandonment. It's the brokenness that comes through the accidents. It's the brokenness that comes through abuses. And these cause us to miss the mark. It, it, it gives us a clue as to why do I always do what I don't want to do? We touched on it briefly, and I'm trying to be careful in the crowd how I touch on particular brokenness. But if we're broken in the area of our sexuality, maybe the repetitive sin is always being involved with someone or somewhere that I shouldn't be because I'm, I'm reproducing in the area that I was broken. Is that making sense? Yeah. There's a story in the Bible that's going to show us this over the next two weeks. I'm going to use this guy. His name is Mephibosheth. And uh, sometimes I'll get preaching fast and I might accidentally just call him Mo. And no, I'm not talking about one of the three stooges, all right? <laughs> he's in the Bible. His name is Mephibosheth. Let me set it up for you. And he's going to be kind of our, he, he's be kind of our backdrop. Mephibosheth was the, was the son of Jonathan. Let me go back a little farther. Saul was the first king of Israel. Saul had a son named Jonathan. When Saul would die, then Jonathan would be the heir apparent, the king to the kingdom. And when Jonathan would die, then his firstborn son, which is Mephibosheth, would be the king living in the kingdom. Now, if you know the story, it's found in 2 Samuel. We know that Jonathan, we know that Saul and Jonathan, they died on the battlefield, which then meant that Mephibosheth should be living in the kingdom. But instead of living in the kingdom, he has a condition that hinders his position. Mm. He has a brokenness that prevents him from living in the place that he ought to be living in. Can anybody relate? See, he should have been living in the kingdom, but because of some brokenness in his life, he began to live beneath the privileges that he had because of a covenant that was made. Ah. I'm already preaching and some of you don't know it, all right? <laughs> Second Samuel is where we pick up on his story. In chapter number four, verse number four, here's how it goes. It says, Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He, I want you to get the picture of this. Some translations say he was crippled. His, his legs were broke. I want you to get the metaphorical picture of this. When your legs are broke, it prevents you from being able to move towards your goals. It, it prevents you from forward progress. So it's not that his arm was broke. It's his legs were broke. The things that help move him from point A to point B. There are some that you are realizing that you're no further along today than you were the day that the accident happened, that the incident happened. My, my emotions have not gone any further because I've been crippled in my emotions. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. His nurse picked him up and fled. But as she hurried to leave, he fell and became disabled. One translation says that she dropped him and crippled his legs. Mm, mm, mm. You see, some of our problems are the things we do to ourselves. Mm, mm. But some of the problems are because of what somebody else did. They were supposed to hold us and they dropped us. They were supposed to protect us and they dropped us. And he fell and became disabled. His name was Mephibosheth. Now, this is one of my bittersweet stories in Scripture. It's, it's really one of my favorite Scriptures, perhaps because it really describes my life the best. Almost to perfection, even to the age of five, the first time I can identify when wounds and brokenness started happening in my life. My question to you today is, what do you do when the one who is supposed to protect you? What do you do when the one that was supposed to care for you, 
What do you do when the one that was supposed to aim you toward God's destiny and aim you toward a target and help you reach your destiny, what do you do when that is the one that dropped you? What do you do in life? This, this young boy was destined for greatness. He had greatness on his name. He was an arrow that was ready to fly. He was supposed to live in the kingdom, but he got dropped. And when he got dropped, it crippled him. And it destroyed his destiny. It left him with, again, a condition that hindered the position he ought to be in. Now, I know everybody's looking straight forward, but I have a feeling there's more people in the room than you're letting on that you recognize in life. I ought to be farther along by now, but I have this condition. I'm, I'm fighting back tears because the reality is some of my brokenness was way before I was old enough to make decisions for myself. Oh, oh and it's interesting that this boy that should be living in the kingdom, enjoying all the benefits of kingdom life, is living in a town by the name of Lodabar. Mm -hmm. Li living in Lodabar. Nobody goes to Lodabar on vacation. <laughs> nobody, uh, nobody on purpose goes to Lodabar. It's like nobody on purpose goes to Denny's. How many know what I'm talking about, right? I'm sorry if you work there. That Scratch that right out, all right? He, he, he lives in a place called Lodabar. Lodabar, by the way, Lodabar means the place of no communication. Ah. Mm. He, he, here's a should-be king that because of an accident in his life, he's living in the slums of Lodabar, the place of no communication. It sounds a little bit like we've talked about the last couple of weeks. People that are living in Jericho. Jericho is so tightly shut up that no one comes in and no one goes out. And the walls of Jericho never fell down until the silence was broken. And I'm going to tell you that Mephibosheth will never be healed until he moves out of Lodabar, the place of no communication. We will never move on. We will never move on until we choose to break the silence. And too many saints are still living with silent pain, fighting that you have the right, forgetting, excuse me, that you have the rights as a son and daughter of God, but living below the standards. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. And some of us are settled for crumbs over issues that happened 20, 30, 40, and 50 years ago. So my question is, how long are we going to go before we decide, I'm a child of the king? Come on, everyone. How much longer are we going to go? Let me just give you two points today. I just want to identify, number one, the problem. And I want to talk about the punishment, and then we'll pick up next week. Are you guys with me today? The problem. Let's talk about the problem. See, let's backtrack a little bit. Everything would have been fine. Everything would have been okay. But he got dropped. Mm -hmm. Saul and Jonathan are dead. And everything would have been all right. See, the nurse was trying to protect him because she thought that the same enemies that perhaps killed Jonathan and Saul on the battlefield would now come for Mephibosheth. So she assumed some things, and she was doing her best. Come on, I'm not throwing stones at the nurse. She was doing her best to protect, but perhaps she had a limp also. So before we go throwing stones at parents and stepdaddies and, and uncles and pastors and Sunday school teachers and teachers and coaches, maybe they did the best with what they had. And if you hold on to the bitterness of who dropped you, you'll never have the broken legs healed again. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Everything should have been okay, yeah. but I was dropped. The brokenness of childhood is hindering the target of adulthood. Has anybody ever felt this? Has anybody ever had a dream, a hope, a direction, a target, and just feel like, why is it so hard for me to do what I ought to do? Am I talking to anybody here? Yeah. See, what happens is all of us in this room, whether you can identify with being dropped or not, every person in this room and everybody watching online, we all have three basic needs. And, and when one of those needs goes unmet, the arrow begins to break. Here's every person's, male, female, rich, poor, we all have these three basic needs. We all need to be loved, 
We all want to be accepted, and we all want to make sure we have worth or we all have value. And if those needs aren't met, we'll conclude then, I'm not lovable. And if I'm not lovable, then I must not be acceptable. And if I'm not acceptable, then I must be worthless. In other words, I must have no value. Mm. And, 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 and watch this. Watch this. When those things go unmet in our life, the arrow begins to fracture. The arrow begins to splinter. When one or two, or God forbid all of them, it begins to snap the ability to fly towards our destiny. And, and it's in the fractured places of life. When there's no love and there's no acceptance and there's no worth, that becomes the doorway that shame steps into our life. Right. Mm. Has anybody besides me ever dealt with shame? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's where shame comes. Shame, for our working definition, is the lie that tells us that we are the unfixable problem. And the devil will work hard to make you feel like it's you and you're the unfixable problem and everybody else is getting on and everybody else is doing good, but you are filled with shame. Mm -hmm. I should be in the kingdom, but I'm full of shame. I'm damaged. I'm crippled. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Hold on. Let me back up. Mephibosheth, his name, his name, his name means the shameful one. So the shameful one who should have been in the kingdom is living in the place of no communication. And I'm going to tell you, you will never break the shame until you break the silence. Right. See, yeah. see, there's a difference between shame and guilt. Guilt is behavior-based. Shame is belief-based. Right. Mm -hmm. Are you following me on that? Yeah. See, guilt says I did something wrong. Shame says I am something wrong. Now watch this. I want to show this. And people have asked me since I started this series, my biggest problem is shame. And I'm glad you're able to identify it. But it's not enough to identify it. We need to know how to fight that. And we have a God that has already fought it for us. And because of what Jesus has done in him, there is no longer any shame that should be living and dwelling in us. Right, everyone? Watch this. Shame moves in when, 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 whenever these three needs are not met in our life. That's when shame begins to move in. Now watch this. Let me give you some things that give shame some roots in our life or is gasoline on shame. So, so shame moves in when we're broken in one of those three basic needs. That's when shame moves in. But then shame is fertilized or it is fueled when, let me give you some. These are just some out of my life. Uh, I'm not trying to be cutesy with this first one, but whenever valued voices violate, shame ga gains stronger hold. In other words, whenever somebody that you admire, somebody you look up to, when their words violate what God's word says about you, it only furthers and solidifies the stronghold of shame in our life. Mm -hmm. We're, when, when the words attack us in those three areas, when the words attack our love, when the words attack our acceptance, when the words attack our worth, why? Now, I, I've talked to some of you because I shared this story publicly that I was told, you will never amount to anything. And some of you have come to me and said, I heard that too. See, those are words that attack your worth, that bring shame in the front door. Mm -hmm. Anytime... Somebody that we admire, the nurse, the parent, the pastor, says words to us that are contrary to what God says about us, that is considered verbal abuse, and shame grabs stronghold. Mm. Am I going too deep this morning? Let me give you some more that fuels shame. Perfor when performance doesn't meet expectations. See, we, have the, we, we, we live in a very performance-driven society. There's no A's on the report card. They didn't make the team. Your girlfriend broke up with you. Your boyfriend broke up with you. You had an affair. You had a failed marriage. Any time that what we expect to do crashes and burns, shame comes in and will tell us if you would have done better, if you would have zigged when you should have zagged, come on. And if you were grown up in church, then you can throw a scripture on top of that and said, if you would have prayed more, if you would have attended church more, and the devil will use everything he can to make us feel like it's all on us and I didn't perform good enough, so I'm filled with shame. Mm -hmm. how, how about this one? I, I think shame is fueled when secrets live in silence. 
I, I grew up in a generation. Let me see the hands of anybody that grew up in this generation. And here's what was said in our house a lot. What happens in our house? See? Let me see your hands. Huh? What happens? See, and that's what happens is that it's a perfect recipe for abuse. Because what happens here stays here. Nowadays, we put it on social media. But in my day, you didn't talk about it. And so that's what made it worse, is that first you get abused, and then there is double hurt because you have nowhere to land with the hurt. And so now it's internalized, and it must be me because nobody else is dealing with the things that I'm dealing with. Let me, let me, let me do one more. Are you guys okay? Shame is further fueled when we have abandoned childhoods. Uh, and, and, and it's no secret we have. We don't have to have physically absent parents to be emotionally and spiritually absent. Daddy, you might have a daddy that comes home every day and he sits in the lazy boy and he tunes you out and he's not there emotionally or spiritually. And, and it's like having abandoned childhoods. Uh, parents are so busy doing their own things. Parents, if you were big enough to have kids, then be big enough to be a parent to those kids. Amen. Be engaged in the game. Even if you're divorced, be engaged in the game. Yeah. Mm, that came out a little harder than I wanted it to, but maybe it needed to. It, it doesn't only happen in that situation. It happens in the lives of kids that had to grow up too soon. Am I talking to anybody here? Yeah. Didn't get the opportunity for a childhood. Had to grow up too soon. The child had to become an adult because the adult was a child. Mm -hmm. And, and let, let me throw something here real quick because I hope this will make it a little more identifiable. Uh, um, re remember, sometimes the surgery is the worst, but the outcome of the surgery is a better life. Amen, everybody? We're just doing a little surgery here. Is everybody okay? Yeah. I see some mean mugging looking at me right now. <laughs> I think you're in deep thought, all right? Abandoned childhood. And different children respond to rough childhoods or trauma in the home differently. The firstborns. How many firstborns I got in the house? Let me see your hand. All the firstborns. Firstborn, firstborn. See, firstborns are like, yep, that's me. You know, they got their hand way up there, all right? Firstborns. Here's what happens. In an abusive home, the firstborn usually tries to play the hero usually tries to hold the family together. I want to show you where shame moves in then. You weren't supposed to hold the family together. You're too young to have mature answers in an adult world while you're still a little kid. Yeah. And so shame moves in. And the shame is the feeling of inadequacy. Of course you're inadequate. You were never supposed to. One of the things I dealt with in counseling was I beat myself up really bad because I felt like I should have been there better for my sister that was abused also. And I felt that because of her older brother, I should have been there. But I was only a kid with only kid emotions also. So what happened is the shame came in and it, and, and it tackled the inadequacies I felt as a child. But I was never supposed to be adequate in that area. Mm -hmm. how, how many were, were, the, were the family clowns? Let me see the clowns in the room. Come on. Yeah, I knew that about you, Glenn. You're still a clown, all right? <laughs> Anybody? Where, where's the clowns? All right. Mark, I could see that in you too. All right. Man, some of you are clowns and you're ashamed. That's your shame. All right. The clowns, when there's trauma in the family, they're trying to lighten things up. They're trying to make everything a joke. They're trying to take the attention off the obvious and say, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Right? But then shame moves in through that doorway. It's the shame of insecurity. Am I enough to solve the issues? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when we grow up in a traumatized home, the reliever will rise up. The reliever is the, is the kid that becomes withdrawn because that kid is trying to bring relief to the family and relief to the trouble. I'm not going to create any trouble. I'm not going to ask any questions. I'm not going to ask for new shoes. I'm not going to ask to go to the amusement park because I don't want to create any more fights. And so shame moves in. The shame the shame often looks lonely. Shame will come in and, and cause us to be isolated and depressed. Or how about the rebel? Come on. How many rebels? No, you don't have to raise your hands on that one. I know the rebels. All right. I've met with you many times. All right. The, the rebels. You see, what the rebel is doing is, is they're trying to refocus all the family problems off of mama because she's abused and all on them. So they start breaking rules. So the attention won't be on the fighting in the home. 
But the shame becomes rejection and sometimes addictions. Let me show you one more thing that fuels shame. Is everybody here? Yeah. Give me just a couple more minutes. This will shock some of you. But sometimes what church we go to will fuel the shame in our lives. Sometimes what we think is spirituality will inflict and fuel the shame in our lives. Let me say it another way so it doesn't sound so accusational. Sometimes legalistic theology will fuel the shame in our life. Come on, how many know what I'm talking about? Don't leave me up here alone. It's theology that says, they might not say it this way, but they say it in action. God loves you if. And you better read your Bible enough. And you better pray enough. And you better worship the way everybody else worships. And you better never miss church. And you better, come on, right? It's all the you ought to, should have, could have, would have kind of preaching, right? God loves you if. God's favor is on you if. God's blessings are on you if. And it's legalistic theology that, that will cause shame itself to grow roots in our life. But how many know, it, really, it's preaching without grace. Because grace tells us you don't have to do anything to own God, to earn God's favor. Because grace is God's unmerited favor on us. And when he blesses us, then I want to do right. That's what Romans chapter 4 means, that his kindness leads to repentance. What it means is that God has been so good to me, I don't have to do right. I want to do right. Yeah? That's the problem. Let's talk about the punishment real quick. I got seven minutes to do this. How many believe I could do it? Let me see your hands. Thank you. My dear wife is back, and she believes in me, all right? And the other three people that raised their hand, this is their first time. They don't know any better. Number two. I want to talk to you briefly about the punishment. Watch this. I probably won't get to all this. This is a rather lengthy portion of Scripture. It's 13 verses, but check it out. Let's back up a little bit. The punishment. David asked, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now stop right there because I need you to see a bigger picture. David is a metaphor. He's a shadow of Jesus. David is now in the kingdom. He got into the kingdom after coming out of a cave. Ah, does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. David killed Goliath. He conquered Goliath. Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave. He came out of the grave to ascend into the kingdom. And because of a covenant that David made with Mephibosheth's father, he was then obligated to show kindness to Mephibosheth that was living back in Lodabar. Because of a covenant and because of blood that was shed by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Watch him pacing the hallways of heaven, looking for somebody that he can show kindness to. See, some theology says he's pacing heaven, looking for somebody he can punish for not doing all the right religious things. But this this verse helps me understand that Jesus is in heaven pacing around looking for somebody that he can show unmerited favor to, somebody he can show kindness to, somebody he can show love to. Why? Because of a covenant that he made. Oh, my. Watch this. Watch this. Now, there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him. Let's call Ziba the church, all right? David is Jesus. Ziba is the church. They summoned him to appear before David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, Is there no one still alive in the house of Saul whom I can show God's kindness? David is in the kingdom. Jesus is in the kingdom. And he's looking for a broken arrow living in Lodabar. Filled with shame that he can put his favor on. Ah, yeah. oh, come on. Aren't you glad you came to church today? <laughs> There's still a son of Jonathan. He's lame in both feet. In other words, he's not perfect. He doesn't even know how to worship. He doesn't even know when to stand and when to sit and when to raise hands and when to clap. He doesn't know how to act in church. He's lame. He's not gone up as far along in life as he ought to. He's a broken arrow that looks like he will never hit his target. That's who I'm interested in. Mm. He is at the house of Mekar, son of Amiel, in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Mekar, son of Amiel. Watch this. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied, don't be afraid. 
See, legalistic preaching will make you afraid of God. Mm -hmm. When I mess up, I run away from God. Mm -hmm. But grace will cause you to run to God when we mess up. Right, right. For I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all, can I paraphrase? I'm going to restore all the broken parts of your life. So that you can soar again and you can hit the targets and the plans and the purposes that God has for our lives. Right? Watch this. I love this. You will always eat at my table. Yeah, but what about when I mess up? You will always eat at my table. Yeah, but what about when I miss church? You will always eat at my table from this day forward because I made a covenant with your father that I cannot break. Come on now. Mm, 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 mm. I need to read more of that, but i got to close up, so watch this. Mephibosheth, can you imagine? He's sitting there. He's living off crumbs. He's broken. He's hurt. He's shameful. He has no one to share his things with. He has no one to talk to. He's too shameful to talk about what's really crippling him. He should be in the kingdom. He should be an overcomer. He should be victorious. He should have broke generational curses by now. Nobody has told him that where you're at is not where you have to stay. But all because of a covenant between his father, Jonathan. Let me read this verse to you really quick, really quick. Give me 1 Samuel. Watch this. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. In other words, blood had been shed. Could you imagine Mephibosheth showing up before David like, I don't know what this dude is after. I don't know if I should be afraid or if I should rejoice. Could you imagine him sitting there going... Oh, you have scars on your hands just like my daddy had scars on his hands because of a covenant. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know where you're at is not where you have to stay. I know you, there's some broken areas. I know there's some hurt. I know there's some abandonment. But because of a covenant that Jesus made and blood that was shed, he's not punishing you for not having it all together. Jesus took all our punishment upon him. Come on, everybody, so that we could live in the kingdom. Can you give the Lord a good hand clap on that? Mm-hmm. Let me say this. I got I to gotta wrap this. This will this will make more sense as we do the next parts of his life next week. But I want you to know this: the punishment often in Christians' lives is you start punishing yourself because I'm not worth anything. You start self sabotaging, and you self sabotage every blessing, and you self sabotage every relationship, and you self sabotage every church, and you self sabotage because I'm not loved, I'm not valuable, I'm not worth anything. I'm not accepted. Mephibosheth, it's almost, if you get into his life, it's almost like he's, he's punishing himself for crippled legs that were never his fault to start with. Destroy him. How many more relationships do we have to destroy because of our broken arrows? How many more people do we have to slander? How many more fingers do we have to point All because of the ankles that are crippled. Because somewhere along the way, somebody dropped us. Let me say this before I give you this last verse. Your broken ankles, your crippled emotions, your wrestle with anger, your wrestle with depression, your fighting match with shame is not God's punishment on you. It's not. There's too much wrong theology that says I'm the way I am because I didn't do right. I didn't act right. I didn't say all right. I didn't give God enough love. Those broken places are not God's punishment on our life. If they're God's punishment, then God owes Jesus an apology. Because I'll close with this, Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, come on, old timers. You've been in church a while. You know this verse. Surely he took upon our pain and bore our sufferings. Yet we considered him punished by God. Stricken. What? what? Jesus was punished by God. So all of my mess ups were put on Jesus at the cross. So he's not punishing me now because I have broken legs. He already put that punishment on Jesus. Is anybody glad? 
Watch this, watch this. Stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that bought, brought us peace was on him. The punishment that brought us peace. So you, Christian, ought to be living in peace. Not in shame, not in guilt. Peace that everything I messed up on is on Jesus. So that means call up U-Haul. I'm moving out of Lodabar. I'm no longer the shameful son of the king. Come on, somebody. And by his wounds, we are healed. And that is why Paul comes along in Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 1. And he says to all of us that are in Christ Jesus, he says this. Therefore, there is now, now, now that you've moved from the world into the kingdom. Now that you made Jesus your Lord and Savior. Now that you're a follower of Christ. Now, now, there is no condemnation. Here's a hint. That's code word for shame. There is no longer any shame. There is no longer any crumbs. There is no longer any load of our living to those who are in Christ Jesus. Come on, everybody. Amen. Well, I didn't do it in seven minutes. I did it in ten. Would you stand with me all over this place? Would you stand all over this place? Next week, we're going to continue with some glimpses into Mephibosheth's life.